Hello and welcome to everyone watching live and, and watching back on our support site. So welcome to you too. I first discovered John's work uh, when I attended a workshop that John delivered at York Women's Counselling Service. And then since then, I, I discovered uh, other workshops that John has delivered and uh, his two books, uh, which are definitely worth a read, especially The Plain Guide to Grief. And one of the reasons why I, uh, I suggested that we organise this is because John uh, shares so much about grief models that really relate uh, well to to fundraisers especially fundraisers working in in mem and legacies and especially for funeral people and funeral uh, celebrants because John shines a light in his work uh, on different uh, theories beyond uh, the uh, the work of Kubler Ross which I know that John will talk about a bit later on so so much of what John does resonates I think with the the area that we that we work in as funeral and, and charity professionals so uh that's it really over over to John thank you thank you for, for doing this John we're very grateful thanks Jason thanks for inviting me thank you Sally um I'm really pleased to be here uh I'm I'm a great uh, evangelist for getting grief work right and um and supporting people and, and as uh Jason says you know the last 25 26 years of my life have been uh, just dedicated really to supporting uh, bereaved people and helping others to do the same. Uh, I'll go straight to the training, um, straight to my uh, presentation. And that looks like it. Okay. So I'm going to look at um, six myths that are very sort of um, common for people to understand. Uh, more misunderstand the nature of loss and grief quite often. There's a lots of misunderstanding, really. Uh, and some of those myths really kind of perpetuate. And so so this morning is about dispelling some of those myths. Um, and I've chosen six of the of the, of the most popular. Sometimes I, I in a longer workshop, I, I do another four, so it's sort of ten myths, but I think six is probably enough for this morning. Um, now, everything I teach, and, and, and I do teach a lot um, in different aspects, but everything I teach is always firmly evidence-based. You know, a lot of people will say to me, um, you know, you're claiming that, um, but I think differently. Uh, well, it, everything I teach is a matter of opinion. It is, um, it is evidence-based, and with time, sometimes that evidence changes, and when it changes then I'll change with it. Um, and these are three books that are the kind of backbone, really, of bereavement research, uh, in well, certainly in America and in, and in Europe. Um, they, they came out over a number of years, and they're really expensive to produce, and they're expensive to buy, uh, and I'm not sure that there'll be another one, uh, to be honest. But these are handbooks of, of bereavement, and they're the work of the real leading experts in the field are sort of put into books. They've been edited over the years by Margaret Stroiber and Hank Schurt and some of their colleagues at the University of Utrecht. Um, you should, in, in theory, you should find these in academic libraries if you want to refer to them. But actually what I'm finding now is that some of the key articles um, from these books, even if you can't get hold of the original book itself, uh, you begin to find some of them as uh, PDF chapters on on uh, Google Scholar. For example, there was one I wanted the other day, and, and it's there on Google Scholar. So um, even if you can't get hold of the original books, then uh, th they're available. But, but I just want to make the point that everything I teach is firmly, firmly evidence-based. Um, both of my two books, thanks, Jason, for mentioning them, um, the first one is was written for uh, people working with bereaved people, uh, and that came out, I think, in 2017, I think. It's a long time ago now. Um, but that's, um, that's a guide for, for uh, people that are working with bereavement. 
and the second one, um, which I which came out in to November, I think, twenty twenty, uh, that's written for bereaved people. But I'm finding that increasingly, uh, a lot of people working with the bereaved are using it as well, and they're recommending it. And sometimes, um, I've just just got a whole stack of them from the um, from the printers to take to a hospice because they're going to give them away to some of the people they're working with as well. So um, it's, it's proved very popular uh, and I'm very proud of it, actually. Um, the style of it is deliberately written to be very easily readable. Um, it's written in the same, with the same philosophy that NHS leaflets are written in. Uh, the N NHS leaflets are always written with a reading age of 10 or 11. And uh, Plain Guide to Grief is written in the same way very simple sentence structure, short syllables to in, in the words I use and, and so on. So it's, it's deliberately written like that because when people are bereaved and grieving, they often can't concentrate easily. So, yeah, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very proud of it. I mean, I'm proud of the blue book more than the other one, actually. Um, the other one's a sort of academic work, but the second one is uh, really, you know, from the heart and uh, easily easy to read. Okay, so the big myth is one that a lot of people um, really believe. And if you ask anybody that has got a sort of background knowledge of, of bereavement and loss, and you say to them, tell me what you know, and they'll say, well, it comes in stages, and they were kind of put in place by Kubler-Ross. And so you can ask just about anybody, and they've heard of the Kubler-Ross stages, and because they get parodies in other situations as well. Uh, and I'm going to dispel that myth right from the start. These are the Kubler-Ross stages. Um, it starts with denial and then anger and depression, bargaining and acceptance. They're the stages that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross um, wrote. You often find her name um, misspelt. It's not a Z, it's an S at the beginning of her name. Um, so, you know, that's the first thing you'll often find that people misspell it as well. What people don't know, and uh, it comes as a shock to a lot of people, but they were plagiarised. They were not her stages at all. They belonged to um, Colin Murray Parks and, and John Bowlby. And if you look at the two put side by side, you can see the sort of similarities in those stages. Anger comes out as protest. Um, but the dis this, the depression comes out as disorganisation and and despair and acceptance as reorganisation and recovery. But basically, basically, they're the same. Um, now it happened because <laughs> excuse me, Colin Murray Parks, um, who's still alive, and occasionally I correspond with him. I think he's ninety. I think he's ninety five now. Um. Uh, Colin was working in the 1960s in in an American hospital uh, in Boston, and he was there to interview grieving widows. And he met a young Kubler Ross on the on the ward, and told her about the stage uh, models that he and and John Bowlby had developed. And she listened, and she went away, and a few months or years later i don't know how what exactly what the time scale was but she then started talking about her um stages her grief stages now several things first of all the her grief stages were actually for people bereaved uh, sorry not bereaved but with a terminal diagnosis there's a the stages that people go through when they receive a terminal diagnosis. They weren't originally for a bereavement, but people be began to use them for bereavement. And um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross never kind of disabused that position. Um, also, there's no research behind Kubler-Ross's work, whereas there's a lot of research behind the Bulby and Park stages. Uh, and if you're really interested in this in a sort of deep way, then I can, you know, if you if you contact me, I can always send you references to find out a little bit more about that. Um, but a few years ago now, um, Colin published an article um, in one of the uh, medical journals saying 
that it was time that people knew the truth about how they'd been plagiarised. And um, he hoped that anybody in future teaching or writing about the uh, Kubler-Ross stages would tell this story. And I, and I emailed him and said, I'll promise you that every time I get an audience, um, either in writing or, or like this, then I will tell the story and um, I correct the record. I'll stop there because there might just be anybody want to ask anything or anything in the chat. Is anything, Jason, you can see in the chat. Anybody uh, want to ask that... anything about that now? People who didn't know that, and that comes as a shock. No, we can come back to that. Maybe people already are beginning to be aware of that. Um, yeah, somebody said, um, really surprising. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and actually, um, there's big, there are beginning to be some rewrites in textbooks as well. So again, I've I've been um, working with with authors that have been wanting to rewrite um, some new editions of textbooks where the Kubler Ross stages are mentioned to, to again to correct the record. So gradually, the message is going to get out there. I think it's not a pos it's not a positive message in America. Um, Maybe why I've sold very few books in America. Um, that makes me unpopular. Um, but do you know what? I don't care. I'm really pleased to put the record straight. Well, John, uh, uh, Corinne just asked, uh, is that Bowlby as an attachment theory? Yes, it is the same. Yeah, John Bowlby and Colin Murray Parks worked together at the Tavis Stock for many, many years. And the... the um, the stages of grief came into being um, from their work on working with children separated from parents. Now, actually, although the stage models went out of favour for many, many years, uh, in some ways for good reasons, then they, there's beginning to be evidence from neuroscience and biology that there's something in it. Um, and so there's kind of reinterest with some of us in the stage models, particularly the protest and then the despair that follows. It does seem to be some neuroscience evidence coming out now that sort of backs up that. Um, but in 19, um, no, 2006, uh, Colin wrote a book called Love and Loss, and he says in there that they found that um, well-meaning counsellors and volunteers were beginning to use their model, their stage model, as a kind of prescriptive for working, and they were taking clients through the stages, and that was never the intention. And that isn't helpful. It isn't helpful to do that. But there is, there is there's beginning to be more evidence that there is some truth in the stage models, and they have been well-researched, unlike the Kubler-Ross model, which have never had any kind of research to them. Okay. Um, this is a popular one as well, the idea you need to let it out. Certainly when I was trained, there was a sense that um, it hadn't been a good counselling session if the client didn't cry because they needed to kind of have this kind of discharge of their emotions. And, you know, you should try and really, you know, get your client to really face up to the reality of what had happened. Uh, and that was called the grief work hypothesis. And that, again, has been uh, thoroughly disproven that a lot of people don't need that kind of distress as part of their, of their grief work. It came about because um, Sigmund Freud wrote the idea that um, people need to um, let go of the lost love object, as he phrased it. That if people are really grieving really deeply, um, and, and he called it uh, melancholia, but what we would mean by that a complicated, complex grief. Um, but if somebody's of that kind of melancholic disposition, again, Freud's words, then they need to let go. And that kind of entered kind of popular kind of zeitgeist, really. You know, people used to say, oh, you need to let go and move on. And sometimes people still say that to people. You know, we don't need to let go and we don't need to move on. 
And ironically, and you'll find this in my first book, um, ironically, Freud never let go and, and moved on in the ways that he was telling other people that they ought to. He carried a locket around his neck of uh, a, a locket around his neck of um, people that he lost, and he wrote to other psychoanalysts saying that he held people close to him, sometimes for the rest of his life of, of uh, people that he'd lost. Um, and the only one that he really um, did genuinely um, sort of let go of or kind of move forward um, was his elderly mother when she died. It was kind of he saw it as a kind of a, a relief, really. So it, it was it was different. But but the other losses he he, he kind of hung on to. Um, so you know the idea of letting go, moving on. Um, we we really shouldn't say that to people anymore. And I think fewer and fewer people do, but. It is something we need to watch. Because of his ideas, then what became firmly established was the idea of grief work, and we, it became known as the grief work hypothesis. Helena Deutsch and uh, Eric Lindemann had both been students of psychoanalysis. Helena Deutsch actually worked with Freud. And they believe that people needed to get really upset as a part of that kind of cathartic discharge of their emotions. And um, in 1937, Helene Deutsch wrote a paper that she called The Absence of Grief, which was about clients that didn't cry, didn't get upset, um, didn't apparently be doing, doing their grief work. And she was saying that's a pathological condition and it will do them no good in the long run. And Eric Lindemann wrote this very influential paper um, following the um, a fire in a nightclub where hundreds of people died, and he sometimes worked with the relatives afterwards. And again, he wrote, we have this kind of cure for it now, and we end up with this idea of, um, of grief work that gets firmly established. And in a sense, that's echoed in the work of... Um, um, John William Worden, who, you know, writes about um, tasks of mourning and so on. So we have to take with a pinch of salt the idea of grief work because it's been thoroughly looked at um, in two, two um, places. Uh, the work of um, Workman and Silver in a, in a paper they called The Myths of Coping with Loss. And then um, the work of Maggie Stroiber. Um, when she reviewed the whole idea of the grief work hypothesis. And she's written another paper as well called Does Grief Work Work? Um, so there's lots of evidence that it's not necessary and that people don't need to do grief work. Um, my, my own experience, um, my, mom, my mum and dad died within two years of each other. My dad died suddenly. Two years later, my mum died equally suddenly. Um, I've got a little bit more warning of my mum, but only, you know, only a little bit more. No warning at all of my dad. And I wondered if there was something wrong with me because I didn't cry and I didn't get upset. I didn't get distressed. Um, and it was years and years before I had anything to do with counselling. Um, and I did wonder for a long time if anything was wrong with me. And um, it was a great relief to find out later, many years later, that no, there wasn't. And a lot of people are like that, and it's absolutely fine. And they probably don't need counselling. They're probably naturally resilient, um, but there's nothing wrong with them. It's not going to necessarily catch up them with catch up with them later. It's not the same as when you meet a client that is obviously really, really distressed and bottling it up. It's not the same as that. But you know, a lot of people cope perfectly well without without grieving in that kind of intense way. Uni Wiccan um, is uh, was, was put down as a, an expert. She's quoted a lot in in the literature. Uni Wiccan worked a lot with um, people um, people in a, I can't think which culture it was, but in Bali worked in Bali with people where the custom was not to show your grief at all. And um, she's often cited as an example of showing that. In some cultures, people don't need to grieve at all. Now, I think a lot of people haven't read her original book, um, and I made it my duty to actually read what she actually wrote. And she didn't write that they didn't grieve. What she did write was that 
it's not culturally acceptable to grieve in Balinese culture, but so people do it privately, they do it secretly. So it is that the people don't necessarily grieve, it's just that it's not in their customs. I, th I think she's been misquoted about that. What is useful, and um, I, I keep copies of this. Um, sometimes I have a laminated copy in my briefcase, but I get keep copies of this um, to give away to people because it can be really, really useful um, when, when you're working with people. I think this is perhaps something that a lot of us, even if we're not working in counselling directly, you know, funeral directors, teachers, um, social workers could could do with copying this and giving it away. Um, Margaret Stroiber and Hank Schurt are not precious about this, um, although it is copyrighted. Then I've heard her say publicly, anybody can use it. We're not going to, you know, be fussed about copyright. Please feel free to use this if you want to. So the idea of this is that um, what they've found is that people quite naturally will sometimes spend time concentrating on their grief and sometimes um, on on their uh, getting on with things, distraction, doing other things. Um, the people who cope best zigzag between the two. And one of the things that people often miss, and also I've often seen people redraw this and get it wrong as well. If you notice that the zigzag sometimes stop in the middle, and that means that you're not doing either. You're not looking at your grief or distracting yourself. You're just getting on with things. Um, and you're not even thinking about your loss. And, and those moments get longer and longer as your grief proceeds. But it's important really to see that sometimes people aren't in either place. And it can be really helpful sometimes to, uh, to give this to newly bereaved people and say, sometimes it just helps to distract yourself and come away from your loss. Um, and it doesn't help to do it completely, just as it doesn't help to dwell on your loss completely either. People find, find their own balance and different personalities do that to a different extent. Okay, let's stop a moment, see if there's anything there around that model. Yeah, somebody saying, Cheryl saying, I had a client recently that asked me um, if there was anything wrong with her because she hadn't cried. I, I think it's really important, Cheryl, to, to reassure people. I mean, we can tell from their body language, from the way they are in general, whether they're bottling up something and maybe it is best, you know, let out. But there's nothing wrong with people uh, that haven't cried. And also... Sometimes people really need time to get used to the idea and that distraction can be really important. Well, I think it's really important to, to look at individuality and uh, the uniqueness of each person's grief and give people that space to do that. Okay. Did Beverly want to speak, Sally? Do you think uh, Beverly's got a hand up? Oh, people can't speak on this one, unfortunately. Uh, oh, okay. It's so it's got to be through the on. chat. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Okay. Um, this idea of letting go and moving on, which is kind of, move, you know, again, going back to Freud. this idea of lost love object. And certainly when I first trained, um, I, I trained as a volunteer in the hospice in, in 1998. And it was what we were taught at the time. Nobody had discovered at the time this book that had been written two years before that. Um, but but I was trained, and, and I would say to some of the other volunteers sometimes when we had a coffee break, I'd say, do, do your clients, you know, let go and move on? Are they doing that? Are they letting go? No, they weren't. And so it was only in 1996 somebody challenged that, and Class Silverman and Nickman's uh, classic book came out looking at the idea of, you know, developing a continuing bond with the deceased. And 
that's very important to do that. Now, a lot of people will say to me, what do you mean by a continuing bond? And I think I still don't really understand exactly the nature of a continuing bond because it's so unique. It's so personal. But I know what it isn't. And there's an important distinction between what is a continuing bond and what isn't. So it isn't what Bob Niemeyer, Robert Niemeyer calls freeze framing. It isn't pretending they're still alive. It's not living in the past. It is about moving forward, taking them into your future in whatever unique and personal way you need to do that. And people find their own ways of doing that. So my way of doing it is to remember some of the funny and idiosyncratic things that my parents did and said and so on, and to remember with great fondness some of the kind of family sayings and family beliefs and things that, um, and, and, and smile about them, laugh about them sometimes, really important. My dad had a thing about getting your money's worth out of everything, and that took that to, you know, um, huge length sometimes. And and my mum had a kind of a, a, a contentedness with life, and that she was content with very little, and that's kind of, really useful life lesson. But dad was very curious about the world and I've inherited that as well. And that can be really useful. And if you're working with clients and you want them to begin to develop that continuing bond, one really useful way of doing that is to say, what's their legacy? What's the legacy of your of your, your parent? And I'm, I'm not talking about money or goods or possessions. I'm talking about what did you learn from them? What What is it you take from them that's in your future? Um, and that can be really helpful as well because it can help them to begin to establish that continuing bond. But people don't let go. They take that person. And so I no longer say to people, you need to move on. I say you need to move forward. And there's a difference because moving on implies letting go. It's what people used to say, you need to let go and move on. So I don't say to people, you need to move on. I say you need to move forward when you're ready. Um, but you can take them with you in doing that. Um, let's go, go, go to this, and we can come back to the other one uh, in a moment, but I think this is a really important one. And I, I'm, I'm writing something at the moment. I got asked yesterday if I would write something for a, a magazine around, um, you know, relating to newly bereaved people, be they family, friends, or or, or relatives. Um, you know, what do you say? What do you do? And so on. And I think there's quite a lot of harm done. You can talk to any bereaved person and the harm of people avoiding them. You know, suddenly being aware that there's a um, friend or neighbour coming down the street and they kind of look the other way or dart in another direction or cross the road so they don't have to speak because... And people often say, I don't know what to say. Don't know what to say. Um, and sometimes not knowing what to say affects all of us. And, you know, I've often said to people, I don't know what to say. You know, I really don't know what to say to you. There aren't any words at the moment. This is so dreadful that, um, but, you know, no, I'm here and I'm here to listen, but I don't have any words at the moment. And that can be so much more helpful. And I think what happens very often, and I think this cartoon really kind of epitomizes it really, is that people that are grieving end up um, almost having to apologize and control their grief so they don't make other people feel uncomfortable. And people shouldn't have to do that. They should be free to do it their way. And people are often ready to kind of stop people grieving, stop people crying. But actually at the bottom of it is because they're uncomfortable themselves um, with what's happening. They're uncomfortable with the tears and the distress. And so they want the person to stop so that they feel better. And, you know, bereaved people pick up on these things. And, you know, I mean, I've worked now for like 26 years and talked to hundreds of people that can really get upset and angry even over the reaction that people have to their grief and um 
it's absolutely fine absolutely fine to um just be there it's being there not knowing what to say say that you don't know what to say but you know don't cross the road on the other side really important um And I've just found this the other day and I thought it was really useful. And eventually, one of the things I find quite often is you find things on social media and um, nobody's bothered to find out who wrote it in the first place. I'll spend hours sometimes tracing the original source. So eventually I found the source of this. Um, it comes from a, a web page called Spoony Village where uh, somebody writes lots of these helpful memes. So, you know... When I'm having a dark day, I don't really need you to put the light on. I need you to be with me in the darkness until it passes. That's such an important message. Not about cheering me up or um, changing the subject or, you know, stopping me at getting upset. Just, just be with me in that darkness because it will pass. And I'll stop on that for a moment. Is there any comments or anything? It's useful what Catherine Siegel. Thanks, Ruth. I don't know that book. I'll have to look that one out. Another useful book is called Talking with Bereaved People by Dodie Graves. That, that's a really useful book as well. Just reading um, Marx. Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? This this idea yeah. of kind of finding the right terminology. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm always uncomfortable with battling. Um, I don't know why. I'm comfortable with the whole campaign of standing up to as well. And I, but I don't know why I am. I don't know why I am. Something about living with cancer, um, I don't know, feels, I don't know, better than battling it somehow. I don't know. I'm not, I can't, I can't put my finger on it, but I do feel uncomfortable sometimes. Um, I, I mean, I think the answer is to be guided by what it is that the person is telling you and how they see it. If they see it as a sort of brave battle, then go along with that. Um, that's an important message, Charlotte. Yeah. Um, not just grieving that they've died. You know, you grieve what you'd hoped for and so on. Particularly, I think, in um, losing a partner. Um, you know, that sometimes people will say, you know, we never had that happy retirement that we'd so longed for and so on. They're useful. Okay, I'm watching the time. I'll go back to the slides. Now, this is a tricky one, and we could do with a, <laughs> do with a whole morning to explore this one. Um, so, you know, is grief an illness or is it a psychiatric disorder? I spend hours and hours toing and froing in my mind about this one, reading stuff, um, reflecting on it, and so on. Um I believe there is such a thing as a grief disorder, prolonged grief disorder, sometimes called complicated grief. Sometimes I've believed that there didn't, there wasn't such a thing, and it really depends on what you read. And I read lots of evidence that keeps changing my mind. But I think, on balance, yes, a few people. Um, a lot of authors put it at 15%. I don't think it's anything as high as that, personally. Um, but it's the idea of prolonged or chronic grief. Is that a disorder or not? 
Does it matter if you put a label on it? Um, yes, it does if you live in a country where you can only get counselling on your health insurance if it's been diagnosed as a disorder. So it matters in America. It matters to have the word disorder if you're going to get counselling on your health insurance. It doesn't matter so much in this country whether we label it a disorder or not. We also need to be really careful that if we're going to try and work with somebody that has got chronic grief that doesn't change over time, then we need to be absolutely sure that we're working in ways that we can actually genuinely help them. And it's quite skilled work, but there are now um, there are, there's now a lot of research to help us do that, and there's ways of counselling now to do that to help people through um, prolonged grief disorder. But I think it's very very rare, and I think um, in 26 years I must have worked with hundreds of people. Um, now I think it's fair to say that people that are um, uh, have got prolonged grief disorder may well not come for counselling. So it, it's kind of skewed statistics. But I've only seen five or six people that I would say for definite uh, are not helped by counselling, and nothing changes them over time. Um, that's five or six out of hundreds. Um, so I I do think it's quite rare, and it's probably rarer than that figure of 15% that suggests. Most people grieve healthily. Um, around about half of people don't need counselling at all. And, you know, we shouldn't leave people thinking that they do, and that's really, really important. That, it's, uh, that when I meet people and I do the first assessment when they've been referred to me, around about half... I, either I will say or they will say at the end of the hour, I think I'm okay now. Um, or they may not say it there and then, but when it comes to their to their counselling appointment, they might ring up and cancel and say, I'm okay, that first session was really helpful. So, um, again, if you want to know a bit more about that, you can always contact me. So that bottom line, the kind of resilient line, is round, I think, I think, um, the author of that, George Bonanno, um, I think he wrote that 48% of people in his research came out there. And then you've got this middle line, which I think is really important, and that's where most of our work will be. And that's a group that are slowly recovering. But notice that that time scale is two years, whereas prolonged grief disorder can be diagnosed after six months. And so I think some people are grieving quite normally and healthily, but they're taking a long time about it. So I don't think you can call that middle line, that recovery line, a disorder. Those are people that we work with, and it may sometimes be quite a shallow, um, quite a shallow trajectory downwards. Particularly, we've found working with people bereaved by COVID, we've found some very shallow trajectories but we're still seeing change. So it's not chronic grief. We're not seeing that top line. So that's really important to kind of bear that in mind that sometimes people might be grieving for a long time, but if there's slow change, that means that it's not prolonged grief disorder. Um, people often ask me about this and they ask, um, they ask if they can, uh, you know, find out a bit more about this. And people will say, when you say sometimes in your training um, that a lot of counselling isn't effective, where does that come from? Well, it comes originally from this article, but there's been some more published since that indicate that sometimes bereavement counselling isn't very successful. I think you'll find this article now online. Um, if you put that title in, uh, I think you'll be able to find it online. Um, but what they found after looking at many, many pieces of research in this meta-analysis in that article was that if people are grieving healthily, mildly, there's not there's little or no help out of counselling. And I would agree with that. I don't think people that are grieving mildly and healthily um, should be put through counselling. You know, they, they don't need it. 
the the moderate grief well they are they they found that the it, it it helps a little bit but the effect doesn't last to which i would say does it matter if it doesn't last if it's helpful at the time so i think there is a good case for working with moderate grief in that kind of human reassurance um and you know people benefit from it in terms of it generally um just changing their their kind of outlook their level of depression and anxiety and so on if that doesn't last i don't think it matters too much as long as it gets them through the first few months and then if we get the treatment right and i'd use the word treatment very rarely but if it is complicated complex grief then it does need um very very careful skilled work that may be called treatment and there's now um a, a 16 session um counseling course that you can put clients through 16 hours very very carefully structured which has been shown to work um again if you want to know more about that i can tell you but basically it comes from the center for complicated grief at columbia university um, the author is Kathy, Catherine Shear and her colleagues, and you can buy a copy of it online uh, for about 30, 30, 40 pounds, something like that. You can buy a copy of the manual if you want to do that with clients. And I have met people that do it within the, within the NHS, that there is a version of it used in, in the NHS. And again, it's been found to be effective with um, that prolonged grief, which you can label a disorder. I think grief never really ends personally. I think we go on grieving for that person for the rest of our lives. Um, my, my son died in 1982. Uh, we're coming up to the anniversary of his death. Um, I don't think I'll ever stop grieving, but you kind of, you, you kind of learn to live with it and you kind of adapt to it. You can still get tearful at times and I can still be triggered by babies' coffins on television programmes and things like that. So, you know, I think um, I think that grief is something that you kind of adapt to, and I think that's really the important part of a lot of counselling, is, is helping people see that those grief will change over time. You can reconcile yourself to the loss and you can adapt to it. But it, it is really much the same all the way through, except that you just get used to it. I spent, as some of you will know, um, six years uh, deciding that I was really going to get try and get to the bottom of what happens in bereavement counselling. What is it that clients do to change? How do we find out how they change and how do we measure that change? So in a nutshell, these are the conclusions from my six years of um, doctoral research. What is it that clients do that then makes life easier? Um, they have to be able to talk in detail about the death. They might still get a little bit upset, but they don't get overwhelmingly upset. And that there needs to be that point where the counselling can end if they can do that, plus all the other things on this list. They need to be able to make some sense of the death. That's important. That's really important. And one of the things that COVID has done is taken away people's ability to make sense because they often weren't there in hospital. They weren't able to find out. Hospitals were very busy. They weren't always able to find out exactly what happened and so on. So, um, and, and, and deaths where there's no body, you know, where there's probably a death of a missing person or, or whatever. Again, that complicates grief somewhat because you can't make sense of it. So it's important that people can make sense as much as they can. That dual process model, that moving between loss and restoration, really important. People need to be able to move comfortably between sadness at times and getting on with life. And it does help if people can form their own unique individual continuing bond in whatever form it takes for them. So you take them into your future. 
Um, this is a difficult one, and this is one that can take a long time sometimes, but it does seem to be important for people to find a new meaning and a new purpose in their life. Um, and when people can begin to do that, then usually they can finish counselling. Let me just go back to that last one for a moment. Um, and I think sometimes um, when you meet somebody for uh, um, who's asking for bereavement counselling, you can find out that they're already doing some of those pretty well. And that's where you can say to them, I think you're going to be all right without counselling. So these are good measures if somebody's been on counselling for a long time with you. And then they can begin to say, yeah, I can do all that now. But that's time to finish. But also it's quite a useful guide for people that have never um, you know, never had counselling that you can you can find out how far down that list they get without without needing it. Um, if you want to write to me and ask me anything, there's my email address. If you want to find out any training that I do, um, then that's where I am on Twitter. Um, I've got a blog page that I don't very often fill in, but that's it. I did post something this week, I think. I can't remember what it was, but I have posted something this week. Uh, and also, I've just started a Facebook page, which is just called John Wilson's Professional Page. And um, anything that I've written, any materials, any articles, any training that I'm doing, you'll find it all there. So that gives us just about a quarter of an hour, Sally. That was super, John. Thank you. There's been uh, some generous sharing by colleagues in the uh, in the chat yes. in regards to their experience yes. of grief. And uh, one of the most recent uh, comments I just noticed from, from Jenny uh, was about new meaning is often expressed by starting a charity or fundraising, which seems very appropriate. It's a really good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And funnily enough, I was teaching about that last night. Um, if we're working with somebody that is um, deciding to form a charity or doing some kind of act, some form of activism or so on, then I think we have to be sometimes a critical friend and we have to be really careful that that doesn't take over. Because I know people that are working as, as activists um, in uh, getting justice for people bereaved by COVID. And sometimes they're putting in their activism before their own needs for self-care. And sometimes they could do with stopping and doing a bit of grieving and not always being busy. But I do think sometimes that's what people need. People do find new meaning in setting up charities or fundraising. Um, you know, I've met several people recently that in response to their loss have gone on to be um, hospice volunteers working with other bereaved people and it does give people a new meaning new purpose it can be really useful there's a fine kind of balance to be had um, and I think sometimes we need to kind of be the kind of critical <laughs> critical therapist critical volunteer that you know keeps an eye on that for people because I can sit and I've known people to get really really deep into unresolved grief because they've been so busy um, campaigning I think it's something to watch. I was just going to pick up on. Um, I can't see it's moved now. There's, I can't a, see who it was, there's but... a um, there's a couple of questions in the Q and A. Um, yeah, which I just wanted to bring your attention oh, to. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Um, so Tyler's asked from Cranes and Colitis, what about grief in terms of a life changing disease that could be considered? Uh, would that be considered a state of constant grief? There's only been there's been recently some um, some research on this idea of kind of perpetual grief, um, and it's something I've not got round to kind of looking at carefully yet. But yes, I think so. Um, one of the most useful theories you can you can find this in um, both of my books. The original article was 1971, but it's what we call assumptive world theory which was devised by Colin Murray Parks. And it's really important in lots of different kinds of losses because it's the idea that when you get this 
this particular loss, this particular change in your life, then your world is shattered. Your The assumptions that you made about your world are shattered. And sometimes chronic um, diseases, a sudden diagnosis of a chronic disease or, or a life-limiting um, disease that is eventually going to mean that you, your life is shortened, then all those change your assumptive world. So I've quite often, when I'm working with people, will use assumptive world theory because it can be really useful in those circumstances. Uh, but, yeah, this idea of a kind of perpetual never-ending grief is something that is fairly new on the scene, and it's something that I'm uh, researching at the moment. But I do think that even in that, this idea of assumptive world theory is really helpful, helping people to recognise that and adapt accordingly. Great. I know Thank somebody you. said, somebody asked a question about um, faith. Does faith help? Do you know, I'm re I mean, I don't have a faith, but I'm really envious of people that do. Um, and sometimes it helps enormously. And um, sometimes it doesn't. So, um, you know, I met people who are kind of hampered by their faith and but also sometimes what they're expected to believe as part of their faith that they don't really want to believe. And again, I could... I could teach for half an hour on that alone, but um, faith can be really helpful. And I do envy people with faith personally, but it's not always helpful. Sorry, sorry, you said another one in the Q&A. Yeah. So Hannah's asked, do you think society has lost the ability to really understand grief or be sympathetic to it, especially when it's not an immediate family member? Or has that always been the case? I don't know. I think if you look at back at historical accounts, there's a lovely account. I can't remember what the book's called, but you might be able to find it in line. I used to live in Staithes on north of Whitby, south of Middlesbrough, uh, on the on the coast, little fishing village. And somebody wrote an article a few years ago now called Death in Staithes, which looked back at how people used to grieve. And I think sometimes when whole communities grieved, when it was a very kind of public um, shared grief, it was very different now. And I think we kind of sanitised grief. You know, at one time, bodies were kept in the house, they were washed in the house. Um, and I think we probably lost quite a lot of that as grief has been kind of sanitised. It's not true of all cultures. Um, you know, some cultures still are concerned with um, tending the body after death. But I do think maybe in, would I say, white white Western culture, we possibly have lost quite a lot. Um, and that's sad. That's sad. And I think we can go somewhere to get in that back if we're kind of death aware. Um, we, we've In in, uh, in York on the, I think it's the um, 6th of December. Anyway, it's the Wednesday uh, in December, first Wednesday in December. We've organised a kind of a grief awareness day there. It's Grief Awareness Week that week, so we've organised a day at our community centre just to talk about these kind of things and make people much more aware of death and grief. Yeah, and you talked earlier about making sense of the death and um, somebody's asked what your thoughts are on that in the case of suicide. That's a really good one, really good question. Um I've worked with many people bereaved by suicide. I've never met the same response twice. I've met people that needed a lot of counselling after suicide. I've met people that didn't need any counselling after a suicide, even when it's been a very close family member. Um, quite often, people are quite good at making sense of the death but and I think sometimes I really need to do that. I mean, people need to make sense of why people um, felt that kind of need, why their loved one felt that kind of need. Um, and that can be really helpful sometimes if people spend some time exploring that. But again, it's about dealing with that individuality, working with exactly what that client needs. And as I say, I've never met two people bereaved by suicide with the same needs. John, there's a, a couple of questions, I think, from funeral people. Uh, and I think we're leaning into the, the kind of social political side of of uh, loss and grief now. But they're mm. asking around uh, direct cremation, so direct 
funerals and and the impact that that has on the grieving process that's quite a big topic hmm. it is again i think it's very much down to the individual i think one of the things that sometimes happens and we call it disenfranchised grief is a, a you know a direct formation can happen and somebody later on uh you know a family member that maybe had not hadn't been notified and so on and so i think sometimes they feel left out and people need that kind of funeral right that that and they're kind of deprived of that. I think so, I think from a funeral director's point of view, I think it would be important sometimes to say to families, are you sure? Are you sure you don't need any kind of funeral right afterwards or as part of the cremation? And it may well be, it may well be that actually it's in the scattering of the ashes that people can get that as well. So all is not lost if it's a direct cremation. But it may be, I think, may be incumbent on funeral directors to explain to people that are not able to kind of, you know, focus and be logical at the time what the options might be. Thank you. And there's a celebrant saying about the the value of uh, of ceremony, uh, mm. and I think uh, I think, and I should have researched this. The, the word funeral. Uh, comes from this idea of procession of togetherness processing along mm. uh, which resonates with both ceremony and mm. so important i think there's kind of this modern thing now of um oh well we're going to make it we're going to make the day of celebration you know we're going to wear bright colors wear a yellow tie or whatever personally when it comes to be my turn I want every bugger in black i want it to be i want it to be sad i want people in black Ideally, I want um, a, a New Orleans funeral band as well. I'm, I'm working on arranging that. Uh, and I want it to be sad because I think mourning on that day is really important. The celebrations can come later at memorial services or whatever people want. But, I, 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 you know, it's not for everybody. And, you know, other people might want something different. But I do think we need to be really careful that the kind of happy funeral isn't an avoidance. and. No, no, I want, I want them. I want a sad funeral. Um, there's a, there's a brilliant article in the Spectator, talking exactly about what you've just said, John, mm -hmm. which is uh, quite eye opening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we've come to the end of the session, and um, so it's been a, fun, it's been fantastic to listen to. So thank you so much for your contribution, John. And also, I just wanted to thank everybody who's joined us and shared their experiences on the chat as well because that has been um yeah that's been very welcome and um you know possibly difficult for some people to share their own experiences so um thank you very much for contributing as um as attendees to the session so yeah and i we are recording this so we'll make it available to our partners if they want to watch back and it would be great if you could encourage your colleagues to watch this as well because I think there's something in here for everybody super and there's a sea of thank you